A part is a living thing. Its associations are markedly human. We talk of the foot, the belly, the shoulder, the neck and the lip, and we intuitively feel a good pulse, honesty, strength, delicacy or charm, much as we do with people. There was only one potter in all Cornwall when Bernard Leach came to St Ives. Now there's a man at work in almost every township, and it's a subject they queue for at night school. British hand pottery was almost dying when Bernard Leach took it, shook it, made it an art form, and earned him the title Rock of St Ives. He was the rock around which the whole of the pottery movement was rebuilt, and it was from Japan that he produced most of his revolutionary ideas. When Leach first went to Japan, he was barely three, but it wasn't until he returned at the age of 20 that the nation left an impression that was to last throughout his life. During his 90-odd years, the great dream of Bernard Leach was to build a bridge between East and West that would cover all values, but a bridge that would have its roots firmly set in the separate cultures of the continents, a far greater ambition than to be merely a master potter. In Japan, Leach was introduced to the mysteries and ceremonials of the wood-fired kiln. Weeks of work, care and concentration waiting for the flames to settle the pots in their final shapes and colours. The gods had to be satisfied as well as the whims of the artist and the laws of science. This, after all, was the heart of all true Eastern pottery. For all his deep philosophy, Bernard Leach found the height of a fire in a time of stress. Disturbed and excited, he was often near exhaustion with the strain of nursing a kiln for 50 hours and maintaining the temperature at around 1300 degrees centigrade. As the kiln cooled came the great moment. It could be the pieces would be perfect. Equally, they could be stuck together, the glazes wrong, the shapes distorted. A time for excitement beyond the barriers of language. <laughs> In the Far East, man works patiently and observantly with natural forces. Humility in the face of nature runs through Eastern art and philosophy, and the artist treats the materials he uses with equal respect and humility, never forcing or disguising the natural qualities of ink, watercolor, or paper, and following in his technique the gestures made by his pen or brush. Bernard Leach began to look on his art as something of a religion. He was always searching for a deeper meaning. To many it was confusing, sometimes disturbing, but well understood by his eldest son. I think one has to go back into my father's sort of um, religious, if you like, history, having been brought up. Uh, in a Jesuit school, was Catholic, and having thrown it over at the age of about 17 when his, when his father died and when he was at the Slade, uh, having gone through a period of um, rejection of uh, the kind of Catholicism that he had experienced, but not uh, rejecting his belief, and therefore always searching and finding a certain amount of that search satisfied in the, some of the Eastern religion, you know, in the Buddhist, especially in Zendoism. It was to St. Ives that Bernard Leach came when he left Japan. It's not clear why he left the East, but it was the prospect of financial security which brought him to Cornwall. He had an invitation from Mrs. Frances Horn, who ran the St. Ives Handicraft Guild. I think she thought that his Eastern experience would be interesting to the St. Ives community. And uh, she wrote to him and offered a certain amount of financial support. He was looked on with suspicion by both the artists and the native population. He was rejected by a local arts group and had to advertise to appeal to the tourists. In the first place, I mean, uh, it was such an extraordinary thing for someone to come and pop. Now, every village has a pottery. But in those days, it was quite unheard of. Then, of course, there was a period when we had 
what we called the Thursday afternoons, and the pottery was opened to anybody who liked to come, and biscuit ware was available to be decorated. And you could have uh, a brush, you were given a brush, and anybody could do their own decoration. And then wait and have tea in the cottage, and when they came back, they were fired, so that by the time they left, they had their own pots decorated. The work of his students occupied much of his time, but more importantly, he wrote the Potter's Book, recognized now as the Potter's Bible. Today, there's a whole Leech school with Michael Cardew, the first and most famous pupil. Yeah, I'd never heard of it. I'd read it. I'd read a little tiny paragraph in Pottery and Glass. To say, Pottery, no, the Pottery and, the Pottery, Pottery and Glass wasn't born at that time. It was the Pottery Gazette published in local trade. The trade week, uh, monthly. An English artist who studied for several years in Japan and has been learning the secrets of Japanese phrases, etc., et all the usual mumbo jumbo, has, um, has is, as we hear, he is settling in St. Ives, um, where he has a Japanese uh, sister. And here is a little picture of what he's made, what they are making. It's a little black object described as a bear mug. And that's all, that's all I knew. And I read that and it didn't mean a thing to me, but I accept, of course, it was important. He went over to the pottery. It was a Saturday afternoon. The pottery was shut. Hamada was there, living there. And Hamada directed him across the fields, the two or three miles, to where we lived at Carmis Bay. And Michael arrived um, at tea time and was immediately invited to tea. A tremendously vigorous, handsome, very handsome person in those days. And I remember the lively conversation that followed around the tea table, the family tea table, with my father sitting at the head of it and asking Cardew one or two sort of piercing questions as to what made him think that he was interested in pottery and so on. Um, I don't know whether he gave very sort of clear answers, but his enthusiasm was so keen and his personality so, so attractive that my father accepted him and he came, you know, from then on that he was accepted at the pottery and so he worked at the pottery from 1923 to 26, for three years there. Nice of the leech pottery. Oh, yes, it was lovely, really. Very hard. <laughs> Very hard. The leech pottery was incredibly poor in those days. You see, I mean, we haven't had... We hear now about 2,000 pounds every other week. Nellie Marshall brings me round a cutting out of the paper. Saying, and this, the leech's early work is being sold. And we expected to fetch 2,000 pounds and so on and so on or something in the neighborhood. In those days, nobody would, nobody would fork out anything. They, because I, an, an art pottery? No. The idea about art pottery in 1920s, early 1920s, before Leach got operation, art pottery was something very brightly colored, very technical, extremely perfect which somebody else had made for you, and then you concentrated on glazes and different colors and all these. And these terrifying things were produced in small studio kilns in stoke on trent and other places. Bernard Leach's work was entirely new to the West. The shapes, the colors, took 20 years to win acceptance. But from his students, there were few doubts about his genius or his skill as a teacher. He never was a te professional teacher, but he was very, very good telling you things. And when I first went to St. Ives, he sort of took me in hand a bit. He said, well, uh, if you're... Not because I was trying to do anything so special, but... Uh, we were all crazy, you see, 